Well, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce to you Alex Smith, uh, Assistant Professor of Economics at Virginia Tech. Alec has a strong connection to the U of A, having received his PhD in economics here. And his work is in behavioral and experimental economics, as well as in neuroeconomics. What's very interesting about Alec is also that he has been an equities trader uh, and a stockbroker at Wade Bush and Charles Schwab for uh, a number of years. So, um, so that's, that's, I find that super exciting. Um, after his PhD, Alec was a visiting scholar at Caltech and has been uh, working there with Colin Kamer and Antonio Rangel. And his work has been published in top outlets, including Management Science, PNAS, the American Economics Journal, and, and Neuron. So Alec, it's a real pleasure to have you here and to continue our speaker series at the Arizona Think Tank for Behavioral Decision-Making with your talk. Um, just as a note on the Think Tank, um, this, this semester we have um, other talks coming up as well as in the spring. So please check out our website for, for the upcoming talks. Um, so Alec, uh, again, a real pleasure to have you here. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, Martin, and thanks for having me here. It's nice to be back uh, at the University of Arizona, at least virtually. Um, I'll actually be there at the end of the month too, I think, for the ESA. Um, so today I'm going to talk about um, some, kind of give you a, an overview of uh, a collection of projects I've been working on in, uh, in studying arousal and attention and risky choice. Um, and I guess um, all of the projects kind of fit broadly in the category of trying to understand how emotions affect decision making. Um, so I think probably in behavioral economics, the most well-known way for emotions to affect decision making is, is that they affect valuation. Um, so you have examples like um, the affect heuristic or risk as feelings. And then um, those are kind of psychological theories, but um, formal models, you know, we have of uh, regret, disappointment, anxiety. Martin's worked on guilt. Uh, and Martin and I, together with Paolo Batagali, have worked on anger. Um, one of uh, Martin Dufenberg's students, uh, Lena Anderson, has a new paper on modeling fear. Um, and so all of these are, are ways that emotions can impact valuation. But there's also a long tradition in psychology about um, thinking about how emotions affect more procedural aspects of decision making, like how attention is allocated or how information is processed. And the papers that I'm going to tell you about today kind of start by loose, they're sort of loosely influenced by this valuation idea at the start. And you, I think you'll see a trend towards considering how emotions affect attention and information processing as we move through the talk. And the big picture, what I'm interested in is, uh, you know, on the left-hand side, you have some people doing my old job, as Martin mentioned, uh, although it's so long ago now that I you know, who knows what they actually do in this job. But, um, and then on the right-hand side, you have some guys running from a bear in the, in the, in the woods. So, <laughs> and so, you know, fundamentally I'm interested in, are these, you know, is there a relationship between how people feel when they're running from this bear and how people feel in a bear market? So I'll talk about three papers today. Uh, One's an older paper on neural activity during asset bubbles, and uh, then two works in progress on attention and arousal in uh, sequential investing and in uh, kind of old fashioned lottery choices. Okay, so the first paper is on called Neural Activity During Laboratory Asset Market Bubbles, and it's with Terry Lorenz and Justin King, Reed Montague, and Colin Cameron. It's published in PNAS. And the motivation is that it's really important to understand what causes uh, bubbles and crashes. Bubbles distort economic incentives, lead to misallocation of capital, and um, often end in you know, macroeconomic crises like the subprime mortgage uh, crisis that we had uh, 10 years ago or so. 
And <laughs> bubbles, you know, they're not a recent phenomenon. Uh, this is a quote from um, uh, Carmen Reinhardt and Ken Rogoff, whose book basically tell the title of their book tells the whole story. This time is different. Uh, the ability of governments and investors to delude themselves, giving rights to per periodic bouts of euphoria that end in tears, seems to have remained a constant. So here's just some examples going back to the tulip bubble. Maybe there were bubbles even before then, but uh, I'm not aware. If anybody has older bubbles examples, that's those are interesting to know about. And what we're going to do in this paper is to look for psychology and neuroscience for insight into why this pattern persists. So, for example, Bob Schiller says irrational exuberance is the psychological basis of a speculative bubble. And in, the, in this paper, we'll look for a, a, a neural, a biological basis for that. So we're going to do an experimental asset market in the, you know, it's the, the Setup's a little bit different from Smith, Suhanek, and Williams, but a lot of you are probably familiar with that paper. Um, the, the design reliably generates bubbles and crashes. Um, one thing that's different from Smith, Suhanek, and Williams is that it has a constant fundamental value. Then we're going to look at neural activity in the scanner and look for neural biomarkers of bubbles, and then look a little bit deeper to see if there are things that um, explain individual differences. The market design. There's two assets. There's a risky asset that I'll sometimes refer to as a stock. That's how we refer to it for the subjects. There's a risk-free asset uh, that we call cash. The risky asset pays an uncertain dividend. The risk-free asset pays uh, a certain interest rate every single round. At the end of the experiment, the risky asset converts into F units of the risk-free asset, which are then converted into US dollars. Um, I'll show you about the how, how we determine fundamental value in one sec. Um, there's 50 trading rounds. So we had to be careful in how we um, let subjects trade. It, you know, they don't have a keyboard in the scanner and they can't type in any numbers. So what we ended up doing is uh, showing them prices and asking them if they want to sell, hold, or buy in response to that price. And then we they trade in a call market behind the scenes every round for 50 rounds. And the constant fundamental value. Oh, that's annoying. The the slide got the equation got a little Alec, bit messed Alec, up. Can I, ask a question? can I ask a question? Yeah. So, is there just one person in a scanner trading with people who are not in a scanner, or do you have multiple scanners linked together and and you make the market that way? Oh, sure. There's twenty p. I, I'm I'm I think it's coming up on a later slide, but um, the the way we did this is there were twenty people in um, the behavioral lab at UCLA. And then three people here at Virginia Tech in three different scanners. Everybody's linked up. Okay. okay. I think sometimes we had two, you know, not exactly, but yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, so the way you determine the constant fundamental value is that you set the exchange rate F equal to the ratio between the expected dividend and the interest rate. The expected dividend was 0 0.70. It was either one, one experimental unit of currency or 0.4 unit experimental units with equal probability. Divide by the interest rate, which is 5%, and you get 14. If you pay people 14 for their stock after the last round, then you get a constant fundamental value throughout the whole experiment. OK, and then this shows you the trial to trial design. There's a lot of stuff on this slide, but just briefly, they saw a uh, summary screen. Then they made five trading decisions from randomly drawn prices. Then we cleared the market behind the scenes. Then they saw whether they bought or sold or did nothing. And then they see how much they earned in dividends and interests. And then they repeat that again, uh, 50 times. And the fMRI analysis is all gonna be looking at this particular screen that says whether or not they traded and what the price was. I think this particular price was one of the more extreme prices we saw in the experiment. Remember the constant fundamental value is 14. Okay, and here's that slide that Charles was asking about. 16 markets, uh, average of 20 participants per session and two to three fMRI participants. So uh, with uh, 44 total. 
Okay, so I told you this design uh, uh, robustly generates bubbles. There's all 16 markets on the left-hand side. You can see, um, you know, they were large, they were small, but in the middle of the experiment, prices are pretty consistently over fundamental value. And here's an example session on the right. Um, you know, this is kind of a middle-sized bubble. The price went up to 40. The fundamental value is the stash line here. Uh, trading volume is pretty consistent if, if anything picks up during the bubble and the crash. Um, and then down below what you see are the um, shareholding paths of each individual subject. Um, the bolded subjects are in where the people in the scanner. So you have sort of uh, one speculator, one kind of mm, passive investor and then a pretty strong fundamental trader here who got out of the market and just sat there the the dash line here shows you the go ahead so i, I wondered oh, across those 50 rounds were participants able to kind of predict when the the bubbles occur so was there some learning going on from the earlier compared to the later rounds uh i mean this is a single experiment right here that you're looking at. So, um, you know, people are trading and the price is going up. Okay. Uh, so you, everybody trades in a bubbles market once. Okay. So, yeah. so the idea is you, that's what's going on with this call market design. So this is a unique price every round. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, uh, just to wrap up, the dashed line is the is the profit maximizing shareholding price paths. And it's pretty typical of what people should have done in each of these. Buy early, sell in the middle across the highest prices and get out. It's pretty intuitive what they should do if they were to have perfect foresight. Okay, um, picking it up a little bit. We'll look at uh, region of interest analysis of, of the nucleus accumbens. And then I'll talk about some ROI analysis of round-to-round um, um, -round data in the anterior insula. Okay, here's the nucleus accumbens. And what I'll show you on the next slide is the uh, peak uh, neural activities, bold response to the trading results screen. Oh, uh, I guess I have a little bit of motivation of why we're looking at the nucleus accumbens. Um, the idea is the nucleus accumbens is right in the middle of the dopaminergic reward system. Okay, it's this region down here. Okay, and the dopaminergic reward system encodes reward prediction errors. Uh, dopamine neurons do, they project to the nucleus accumbens and the nucleus accumbens bold reflects dopamine levels. Something really interesting from, um, uh, the neuroscience literature is that dopamine therapy makes Parkinson's patients more sensitive to gains in learning tasks. Um, so I'll come back to that when we think about the interpretation of these results. Okay. And furthermore, when you see bold activity in this region, this is, uh, um, you know, this number is more like a thousand studies now. When people experience when rewards, you see activity in the, in the ventral striatum and nucleus accumbens right here. Okay, um, let me just get to the results and I'll tell you what we did. Okay, so what this what we did here is we took the neural activity and the nucleus accumbens. Um, for every market, we wanted to see what it was like around the peak. So we recentered each each of the the markets around the peak, and that's that dashed line in the middle here. And so the green line is the average price. And the blue line is the five period moving average of bold activity around the price peak. You see there's a big spike in, uh, in, in activity around the peak in prices. Okay. And then we can use this and ask, does it predict crashes? Uh, Ellie, can, I ask crashes you a question? Of, can I ask you a question yeah. about the last slide? So here, so, you know, if, if, if uh, nucleus accumbens activity is kind of, it, it's, it's kind of, proportional to reward, that's reward prediction errors. But you'd expect this graph here to differ based on how many units you're holding, right? So if you if you don't have any units, it doesn't really matter what the price is. In fact, you're worse off if the prices are high because you can't buy anything. 
But if you own hold a lot of units, your your wealth is going up as the price goes up. So I don't know. It'd be interesting to see this thing. I, I know this paper's already published, but it'd be interesting to see how this different is different depending on how many units you hold. Because that's when it really that's when your kind of wealth is going up and down with the yeah, price. Yeah, you want to see individual differences based on how much people. Yeah. Correct. Or just broken down into two groups: the low or people who have low holdings, and people who have high holdings. Actually, like, I have some data like that. You can interpret this better because, like you said, there's always this this issue. I mean, you did you didn't say it, but it was on your slides. This reverse inference problem that you take nucleus accumbens activity and you interpret it as higher reward or payoffs. But any kind of salient stimulus will will activate your nucleus accumbens. So if you see like a price that's a big number. Like the price all of a sudden hits 100, you might get nucleus accumbens activity just because it's a prominent stimulus, right? So, but here, you know, if that only you could sort out the people who have hold have a lot of holdings, they they're actually getting richer as the price goes up. So then it really is kind of reward for them, rather than um, just a salient stimulus. Anyway, just a thought. Okay, um, I can't remember if we looked at I. I I have some graphs that split out that look at individual differences, but they're coming up. Uh, I don't think I have some for nucleus accumbens, though. I have insula. Okay, great. Okay, um, and um, points well taken. Um, you know, this just saw, showing that nucleus accumbens activity is coincident uh, with the rise in prices, but not exactly saying why. Um, it does predict crashes, but that's also could be because high prices predict crashes. Um, here's some individual different stuff that might make you feel better, Charles. Um, on the x-axis here, we have the, the uh, extent to which nucleus accumbens activity predicts buying in the next round, okay, from an individual level regression. Um, and then on the y-axis, we have earnings in the experiment. I think this is kind of getting at what you're saying. Okay, so what this graph is saying is that when nucleus accumbens predicts buying activity, uh, people earn less. Uh, so when nucleus accumbens activity predicts buying, people earn less. Um, so that means, I, so I don't know, it's, it's kind of, there's lots of ways to interpret these things, but one story would be that, you know, people get excited, and, and so the people who buy because they're excited, their nucleus accumbens is, is activated and they go buy are the ones who tend to make less money. That's how I interpret right? this one. Right, so the people who kind of trade like kind of rationally, not because their nucleus accumbens is activating, yep. are gonna make more money. Exactly. Okay. Makes sense yeah. to me. Yeah, cool, all right. Um, yeah, so, <sighs> There's lots of ways to interpret this. You know, we show that neural activity in the nucleus accumbens is linked to the price bubble. If you know the literature, you know that that's also a region that's involved in drug addiction and compulsive gambling and lots of other stuff. Um, and, you know, for future, you know, it just suggests it's worth thinking about what's the relationship between, you know, speculation and in, in investing and gambling. Since as economists, we don't really know why people gamble. It's hard to say why they speculate in stock markets too, but maybe this helps. Um, okay, uh, I'm worried I'm not going to have time to talk about the new stuff, so I kind of want to go quickly through the old stuff here. Um, here is um, ROI data from the anterior insula. We used a region of interest based on a paper involved in risk prediction from a paper by Kirsten Preshoff. Uh, and Peter Vossarts and Stephen Quartz. And we split the subjects up into terciles. I don't have the middle tercile people here because it's not interesting um, in terms of their earnings in the experiment. So um, high earners and low earners, uh, um, what you see is um, the high earners sold before the, these, this data is again, centered around the price peak. The high earners are selling before the price peak and the low earners are buying during and after the price peak. The high earners ha have this spike in anterior insula activity uh, before the price peak. Um, you know, it just suggests that 
um, something's different between these high and low low earners. There's a couple of interpretations. One is that these people get a gut gut feeling that tells them to get out of the market. I guess another interpretation is that they're getting out of the market and it's going up and it's painful. Okay. Um, and um, again, as Charles mentioned, there's a reverse inference problem here, um, but there does seem to be a separation in anterior insula activity between the high and low earners around the peak. Okay, this is the same kind of analysis. This is saying, to what extent does the uh, insula activity predict selling? And um, uh, that's on the x-axis. On the y-axis is earnings in the experiment. And this is telling you that people whose insula was more associated with selling earn more. Okay, and so we said in the paper, this is evidence for a neural early warning signal. And um, that's interesting because this is a region associated with awareness of bodily states, pain, gut feelings, and emotion. Okay. Now, um, so now I'm going to talk about, so one thing that we don't have in that paper and that I got interested in, so, you know, I ran a lot of asset market sessions at UCLA with a lot of, um, you know, undergrads trading in price bubbles. And one thing that's in the paper that 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 I just noticed from running those experiments is that people get excited around the price peak, uh, and I used to describe it to people as their eyes get big, right? The price is you know the price is going up, and they're you know it's really exciting, and so um, that's interesting because pupil dilation um, and you know, arousal in particular are, you know, important, um, um, you know, components of, of emotions. I mean, emotions are multimodal processes that involve, you know, um, perceptual changes, behavioral changes, and um, experience. Um, but um, a big component of emotions is arousal. And so now I'll tell you about two, two studies that look at arousal. Uh, and attention and risky choice. And, um, you know, just, uh, I already talked a lot about emotions in, in stock markets. And, you know, this is just showing you a number of books that link uh, emotion and investing behavior. And, uh, you know, we all know that people talk about fear and greed in the stock market all the time. Um, and, um, you know, classic financial theory suggests that investment choices are, are determined by, you know, risk and reward decisions. But more recently, people have, have linked um, sentiment to asset prices formally. So work by, for example, Baker and Wurgler in the Journal of Finance linked sentiment and asset prices. And, um, you know, one way to measure emotions is to, um, to do physiology. So, for example... Uh, emotional arousal, uh, one way you can measure it is with pupil dilation, which is associated with the activity of another neuromodulatory system, the norepinephrine or adrenaline system. That's a, that's a system that LCNE system governs stress response, wakefulness, uh, attention, arousal, and um, um, all kinds of things associated with, uh, um, um, yeah, I guess, emotional arousal. Okay, and um, here's several, you know, there's a picture on the right hand side of the norepinephrine system. Here's a um, um, monkey study showing that fluctuations in pupil, pupil diameter reflect activity in the locus ceruleus. And then here's another study saying two, here's a study on the left is showing you that um, both pupil diameter, skin conductance, and heart rate are associated with um, emotional uh, viewing emotional images. And on the right, some recent studies saying that pupil uh, diameter is related to uncertainty. So in this study, what we'll do is simulate investment decision making in markets, um, but in an individual decision task, we'll use a known price process um, that's a two. Uh, two-state Gaussian random walk. 
and measure autonomic arousal via pupil diameters and ask, does the uh, um, does this affect the decision making? Here's the task they see. It's uh, basically I was trying to translate the bubbles experiment to the eye tracker here. They see a summary table. Then they um, allocate the percentage of assets they want to the risky asset. They see a new price and then they see a price graph. Uh, we, they're, they're, subjects did two tasks. One involved a uh, low volatility price process and one involved a high volatility price process. You can see that um, uh, zigzags should, are greater over here than they are over here. Um, so I told you some of this already. There's 40 decision trials for each of those high noise and low noise conditions. There's, um, uh, they see they, there's a burn in period. So they watch the price evolve for eight rounds and then they start trading. They start with 50 experimental dollars in cash and 50 in the risky asset. And we did this on 47 subjects. We have some more data now, actually. So we see there's greater, greater pupil dilation in the hard condition, okay? That's consistent with the result I just showed you about um, higher pupil dilation with more uncertainty. This is just showing you that it's consistent over the course of a particular decision round. These are averages uh, across uh, subjects and trials. And interestingly, pupil length arousal increases with um, risk. This is the allocation to the risky asset, but only in the high volatility condition. In the low noise condition, it's pretty easy to, to, to see what's going on. In the high noise condition, it's hard to know if you're in the good or the bad state. Okay, so these people are genuinely taking more risk uh, over here. And then we see another result where um, pupil length arousal now is gonna now we're looking at the relationship between uh, pupil length arousal this round and decision making next round. And um, greater pupil diameter uh, leads people to, uh, on average, decrease the amount of risk that they take. And so now we're going to do a little more structural like modeling. So we're going to fit a fictive learning model, which is pretty commonly used in literature studying sequential decision-making tasks. That's what Terry Lorenz used in his paper in 2007 and a number of papers since. Um, fictive learning is a regret-like model that captures the effect of um, what you could have done uh, on uh, decisions in um, dynamic investing. And we're going to test for an interaction of fictive learning and arousal. Okay. This is motivated by theories that say that uh, arousal regulates the gain in information processing. So you can think of a fictive error as a piece of information that's used to update your, um, um, your policy. And the, you know, the fictive error is basically the difference between what you could have gotten and what you, uh, or sorry, between um, what the right thing to do was either invest all the way um, or uh, be out of the market entirely if it's going down and how much you were invested that round, okay? Um, and the idea is that arousal uh, magnifies the gain in information processing. And, um, and so we're gonna ask, does arousal uh, increase fictive learning? And that's what you see in this regression analysis here. Um, so. So F plus and F minus are uh, fictive errors, positive or negative. And um, these results over on the right are interactions with pupil size, okay? And so what these are showing you is that um, it does seem like arousal uh, increases the effect of fictive errors on decisions. And then this is a little more speculative analysis, but we're gonna- So, so Alex, can I ask you something about this? Yeah. Um, so the arousal is uh, increases fictive error. So is there, I mean, what is the mechanism involved? It's just that people aroused are paying more attention to all the possible payoffs they could, they, all the possible payoffs, including those they could have gotten had they done something else. And is that the mechanism here whereby 
arousal increases effective error estimate? Is it just attention? Do people pay more attention if they're aroused? Um, so the result that I'm showing you, I would interpret as a kind of information processing result saying that in a learning model where people care about fictive errors, that arousal increases the weight of those fictive errors. Okay, just, it just, just it's, a, it's a direct effect of arousal on considering fictive errors rather than some kind of mechanism like you're kind of paying more attention or, or something like that. Okay. Uh, I mean, the, there's different ways to think about paying more attention, right? Because paying more attention could mean you're looking at something or it could mean you're thinking about it more, right? And I guess yeah. I would argue that this is the latter, but in the next slide, I'll show you some visual attention results. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, here we have the summary table, you know, that people see each round when they're looking at their kind of overall position in the market. This is sort of meant to see, be the screen that you see when you log into your brokerage account. Um, and um, what to compute fictive errors, you need to look at your account performance at uh, value changes, right? And, um, uh, or at value change percent here. And, and so, we're still kind of working on this analysis, but um, what we what we think might be going on here is, you know, looking more at these totals is a is a component that you need for for computing your fictive error, and you don't need that to just forecast the price. All you need to do is look at this screen right here. But the fictive learning model, which uh, I should have written down, is basically the um, you know, the difference between the, um, you're comparing returns that you would have got if you were 100% invested, that's this, and the return that you got that round from based on how much you were invested. Okay. And um, what we see over here on the right hand side, I need to move, I see everybody's pictures there. But um, then we estimated for each subject, the fictive influence on the next bet. And then we compared with these kind of uh, fictive eye movement patterns, and we see a positive relationship there. Like I said, it's work in progress, but what we see is there's more people dilation in the high noise condition consistent with um, perceptual studies involving uncertainty. Um, we see that um, taking more risk is associated with more pupil linked arousal and that uh, in the current round, but that pupil linked, ar linked arousal predicts de decreased future investment in the next round. Uh, and it seems we have evidence at least that computationally that pupil linked arousal marks the, uh, um, is associated with um, increased uh, weight of fictive errors. And it seems like we have evidence that that's uh, consistent with uh, corresponding attentional changes in visual attention. Now I'm gonna tell you about a study that looks at the effect of incentive changes on arousal and attention and risky choice. And it looks like is it's 2.36, so that's I have enough time to tell you about this one, good. Um, so we have a lot of different motivations for this one. Um, so it seems like so first of all, you need time varying risk aversion to explain asset prices. Uh, I told you already how autonomic arousal increases with incentives and uncertainty. Um, psychologists have long known that arousal modulates attention and more recently are starting to look at links between arousal and uh, attention and information processing. Um, now, in this literature that looks at visual attention and the choice process, one of the strongest results is that um, gaze fixations um, are, are linked to, um, to decisions. In other words, people choose the things that they look at. So what we're gonna ask in this 
particular project is how do arousal and, and attention interact in the decision process. So what we do in this study is um, we're going to look at how large incentives affect decision making uh, and arousal and the allocation of visual attention. Okay, now we're going to measure arousal three different ways via pupil dilation, via skin conductance, and via heart rate, all at the same time. Okay, so the way this works is um, we took the classic risk taking experiment of Holt and Lori. You can see the choices in the Holt and Lori task down here. Um, in, in that paper, they show these people. They show subjects these tables all at the, you look at all these decisions one through 10 all at the same time. We wanted to see how people respond to each choice. So we're going to break those up into um, 10 distinct trials um, and then um, repeat them twice in each block. And in the blocks, there's going to, the, the blocks are going to involve either low payoffs, okay, where um, the highest payoff that you can get is $3.85. The low payoff is $0.10. Cents. Um, and um, that's the uh, risky lottery. Or the safe lottery involves a high payoff of $2 and a low payoff of $1.60. That, those are the payoffs in, in this block here. Um, in the high hypothetical and the high real blocks, we multiply those payoffs by 50. In the hypothetical trial, we tell people ahead of time that um, they won't be paid for this decision. Before the high real task, we say, we've got the cash and we are gonna pay you for one randomly selected uh, decision from, from this particular block. And then um, as a kind of uh, uh, control, we, we do the low real task again at the end of the experiment. Okay. Uh, so we ran this experiment on uh, 39 participants, uh, 24 of them were male, they were mostly undergrads. Uh, again, there's 80 trials, 20 per block. Um, so there's two sub blocks, by the way, uh, each involving the 10 holt lorry choices. We'll measure uh, eye, um, gaze fixations and saccades and pupil di diameter via the eye link eye tracker that we used in the last experiment and skin conductance pulse rate. Uh, via these uh, wireless uh, uh, psychophysiology devices that you strap on people's left fingers if they're left-handed. Uh, each trial, they look at a fixation cross for two seconds. They look at the lottery choices, which look like this for eight seconds, but they can't do anything. And then um, they use uh, the clicker to, I think, I think it was the clicker. I can't remember if it was the keyboard or the clicker uh, to choose either the top or bottom lottery. And each round, we randomize the location of the payoffs, uh, um, left or right, and left or right here. Um, okay. All right. So we replicate the result from Holt and Lori. Oh, th this is 45 subjects. I said 39 before because we threw some people out for bad eye tracking data. Um, but this is behavioral data. And um, what we find is that people choose the safe option much more in the high real condition, okay? Um, so they're much more behaviorally risk averse when stakes are high and real compared to when stakes are high and hypothetical or compared to low stakes. And I thought I deleted that slide because what I wanted to do was compare to Holt and Lori, this is data from the Holt and Lori experiment. And you can see we can reconstruct their results. Um, this is a between subjects result showing, um, I think this is uh, low stakes. This is 20X, 50X and 90X. The, the further to the right, the switching point, these are, this is the um, probability of choosing uh, the safe option. And the further to the right, the the line flips from the top to the bottom, the more risk averse people are behaving. Okay, we have the same result here. People are much more risk averse in the high real condition. Okay, that's nice because we wanted that to be our baseline result. Okay, so we also see 
a big increase in physiological arousal in high real stakes. Here, what I'm showing you is uh, skin conductance, pulse rate, and pupil size all go up in the high real condition. They go up a lot. Um, so just as an example, this isn't um, normalized in any way. This is just average pulse rate across the subjects in the experiment during each trial of the 80 trials, okay? You can see 20 rounds of low real. Their pulse rate's pretty high. I don't know if this is because, I mean, I feel like 85 is kind of high for undergrad subjects. Uh, maybe they're excited to be in the experiment. I don't know. Um, it stays pretty constant through low real and high hypothetical. And then, um, bam, we get this big spike up. The average goes above 95 beats a minute. Uh, when they start making these high real choices, it stays elevated, although it comes down after they get used to being in that condition, and then drops back down to baseline at the end of the experiment. Okay, then you see results, similar results for um, pupil size and skin conductance, and also phasic skin. We have a, a phasic data for all three measures too. So by tonic measures, what I mean here is, um, the, all of these measures are taken um, when they're looking at the fixation cross. Phasic measures are when they're actually making the decision. So just to show, they're actually highly correlated in this experiment. Okay. So um, there's the change in arousal again. Um, on the right-hand side, what you see is that individual differences in arousal uh, going from the hypothetical to the real condition are correlated with making more safe choices. Okay, so this is the difference in arousal. Oh, one thing is um, all of these measures were pretty correlated, as you saw in the last graph. What we do to compute a generalized measure of arousal is we take the first principal component of all three measures uh, and use that as a kind of uh, uh, aggregated arousal measure. And that's what you see on the x-axis here for each subject. On the y-axis, you see the increase in safe choices from the hypothetical to the real condition. Um, could be negative, but it isn't for most subjects. Um, you can see from looking at this graph also that only three subjects had a decrease in arousal going from uh, hypothetical to real, okay? And that you see that the more that change to uh, high stakes increased arousal, the more risk averse people were. Now, moving on to uh, visual attention, this is kind of a complicated slide. Um, what we show here is the relative fixation duration on each of the four um, parts of the screen here. Um, so it's actually, we include the, both the probability and the associated payoff here, uh, just to get a little bit bigger data. Um, but what you see is the big change here. Um, so this is for each of the four blocks. So this is the percentage of time they're looking at the safe high payoff, that's this one. Uh, the risky high payoff is this one that's here. Uh, the safe low payoff is this one right here. And the risky low payoff is this one here. You can see, um, they, first of all, they looked at the risky low payoff less than all the other payoffs. Second of all, there's a big difference in visual attention uh, in the high real condition compared to the other blocks. They look more at the two safe payoffs and they look less at the risky high payoff. Um, now, we're going to combine a couple of these bars here into attention on, on the safe lottery and uh, visual attention to the risky lottery and look and call that the difference in, um, uh, oh, sorry, this is a uh, high attribute minus low attribute uh, dwell time advantage uh, on safe and risky. So how much more they looked at the safe high payoff uh, versus the risky high payoff, how much that went up in the high real condition versus the hypothetical condition 
is also correlated with the increase in choosing safe. Okay, so overall what we see is more arousal leads to more safe choices, more attention to the safe lottery, uh, at least to the, to the high payoff of the safe lottery leads to more uh, safe choices. Okay, so we already looked at the relationship between um, incentives and autonomic arousal in risky choice. We talked about the relationship between incentives and attention. And now we're gonna try to link those two. Um, so the way we're gonna do that is to um, build a drift diffusion model of the decision-making process. Um, if you know, the drift diffusion model says, uh, essentially it assumes that evidence accumulation in a given trial um, results from a Gaussian uh, random walk with drift. Uh, and, um, when, and, and so um, the process evolves over time. When the process hits a barrier, you, you make a choice. If in this example, if it hits the top barrier, you choose the safe option. And if you, it hits the bottom barrier, you choose the risky option. Okay. Um, that's a simple drift diffusion model where the dependent variables, whether you chose safe or not, and, um, and then you, you um, um, the ingredients of the model is the decision time. What we're going to do in this model that I'm showing you, we allowed the barrier to vary with uh, the level of arousal. And we found that there's a positive relationship and that replicates the results from a previous study by uh, people in Michael Frank's lab uh, in a well-known paper, Kavanaugh et al, 2014. Okay, so now what we're gonna do is build a much more complicated model to try to understand how people process information in this task. And, um, what we're going to do is build on the attentional drift diffusion model um, that's been developed by uh, Ian Krabic and um, also studied in that Kavanaugh paper. And um, that the attentional drift diffusion model says that the drift rate towards each of the, the in our setting, risky or safe options is going to vary depending on whether you're looking at particular uh, attributes. Okay, and that's a, that model captures this well-known phenomenon of gaze bias, whereby people choose the thing they look at more. And, um, and so this would be a, this top line would be a kind of standard attentional drift diffusion model that uh, allows, and, uh, um, allows for an additive gaze bias term and let's gaze bias interact with the subjective value difference, okay? And the common finding in, in some recent work, um, I need to cite the paper here, but it's uh, Ian Krabic and Stephanie Smith in Psychological Science in 2019 shows that um, gaze bias uh, has multiple, multiplicative effect on the subjective value difference in, in the model. Uh, and also, uh, you know, it's not here, but if you're not familiar with the model, um, drift diffusion, simple drift diffusion models, at least, imply the uh, logit choice. Okay, um, um, there are several papers that show that, but one of them is uh, recent in management science by Ryan Webb. Um, and so we're going to use a well-known software package to estimate the model. We're going to input subjective values into the model that we're going to fit uh, via a power expo utility function, which is what Holt and Laura used in their paper. Uh, we did, uh, actually, this isn't, this isn't true anymore. We linked the evaluation phase and the selection phase, uh, in, in the model. And I actually don't want to get too into the nitty gritty of the model, um, because it's super complicated, but we allow the relative weights for each attribute to vary depending on what people are looking at. Um, and that's the full model. Let's not stay here too long. <laughs> okay. Uh, but what we do do is we're gonna take that um, more heuristically, we're gonna take that uh, attentional model 
And we're going to hypothesize that the gaze bias from looking at different uh, um, outcomes is going to be modulated by arousal. Okay. And that's what we find here. Um, so the dashed lines here show you the, uh, so this is the selection phase on the right. I'm more interested in the evaluation phase. So the selection phase is uh, they've looked at it for eight seconds and then it's free response. By that point, we think that they've basically already made up their mind and, and, and we know what they're gonna choose. Uh, sorry, the subjects know what they're gonna choose. Uh, on the left-hand side is the evaluation phase. And what we see there is that um, we put a bunch of the parameters in, from the model together um, and interact them with arousal. And you can see that um, the dashed line shows the interaction with arousal. And what happens is that um, the arousal modulates the uh, attentional discount for the high payoffs. Okay, this is the, the straightforward effect of attention on choice, and this is the interaction with arousal. Now, um, backtracking from the crazy uh, um, drift diffusion model, let's just ask another question. Okay, that's motivated by the idea that um, high stakes and arousal together cause mistakes. So you might be familiar with a paper um, by Dan Ariely and, and his co-authors from a while back called Large Stakes and Big Mistakes. Uh, the idea is that in the literature is that large stakes cause increased arousal and uh, high arousal causes mistakes. So we have two different ways of looking at task performance. And one way of looking at effort, which is this one right here. So, um, so first of all, um, reaction time decreased over the course of the 80 rounds. We think that people just got used to doing the task. But um, when we detrend it using a quadratic time trend and then um, we, we, we compute the detrended reaction time for each block, we see that people took longer in the high real condition. Okay, so, and then we have two ways of measuring task performance in this task. They repeated each lottery choice twice, once in each sub block. And so that's what you're seeing here. Um, yellow is the low real condition. So they're learning and you see they flip flop back and forth a lot in the low real condition. Um, then in the hypothetical condition, those flip flopping goes down, but it's, you know, still substantial. Um, in the high real condition, we see the flip flopping moves to the right a little bit more consistent with the idea that they're more risk averse. And so indifference is closer to the right here. Okay. And then um, choice inconsistency goes up again in the low real, the second low real task. Now, another way of measuring choice quality comes from the eye tracking in the uh, um, choice process literature. There's a, there's a measure called the pain index, P-A-Y-N-E. It's named after John Payne, who's a psychologist at Duke. Um, and that's, a, that's, a, that's an index that ranges between uh, minus one and one. And it is the ratio between the number of um, within option saccades and uh, between option saccades plus, but plus, plus uh, 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 within option saccades. And the idea is higher numbers of the pain index mean more uh, within option saccades. And they argue in the literature that that's more consistent with rationality. We're not going to you know, say whether we agree with that or not, just compute it here. And what you see is that overall that number's highest than the high real condition here. That's the orange line. Uh, there's an interesting dip at uh, um, when the probability of each payoff is 50%. Um, you know, we think that has to do with the fact that that's just an easier choice and people can make it faster. Um, but especially for, and remember uh, 100 here is 100% probability 
of getting the, the risky high payoff. Uh, so, you know, it makes sense that there wouldn't be a lot of separation there. Overall, we interpret these results to mean that um, people aren't making more mistakes in the high real condition. Okay. If anything, the results are consistent with them exerting more effort. Okay. Um, and that is the last result from that experiment. So high incentives increased implied risk aversion, arousal, and effort and change attention to where people look more towards safer and more important information. And arousal seems to modulate the way that information is processed, in particular, the link between uh, visual attention and value computation. So overall, what we're finding is, you know, People have, have argued for a while that arousal uh, and emotions in, in more broadly uh, affect choices directly through changes in the, uh, things like risk attitudes or um, the way values and payoffs are constructed, okay? Um, and what this literature, sorry, this research shows that arousal is affecting choices also indirectly that arousal affects the way people allocate attention and process information. And, you know, we're still learning a lot about this and figuring out how to incorporate these techniques into, um, you know, behavioral decision-making experiments. But, you know, I think that understanding how the links between arousal and attention and decision-making can have benefits for understanding, not just decision-making, but also for, making better policies and, and uh, improving health as well. And just to say thanks. Um, so um, these are some of the people that worked on these projects. Uh, my uh, recent uh, PhD grad, Zizo al Sharawi is a postdoc at Princeton now. And uh, Flora Lee and Richard Zhang are both at Nanjing Audit University and also work with Cheryl Ball uh, here at Virginia Tech. And um, and then on the fMRI project, um, um, you know, we worked with uh, Colin Kammerer was my postdoc advisor and Reed Montague and Terry Lorenz as well.